I really appreciate your uh, attendance. It's a, it's, we really enjoy having this group of people come in. We have this uh, program three sessions a year, and uh, it's been going on for more than 25 years now. And uh, so that means thousands of students like yourself have gone through this program. And our goal in this program is to uh, convince you that uh, the life of science is something that, uh, that anybody can participate in. At least that's my goal. And, and so, and, and to give you an idea of what are the engaging ideas in, science, in physics in particular, and how that, uh, how it all fits together, and how it comes together in a research laboratory like Fermilab. Now what I'm gonna talk to you about today is something that you uh, usually don't hear about in a science lecture, which is the uh, impact that science has on society and vice versa, the impact that society has on, on science, on the practice of science. And uh, I'll go into uh, rather far-flung uh, aspects of this and uh, talk about, uh, first of all, what's kind of the history of science in the 20th century that's just passed and, and how, how the two interact. And then I'll go over some very significant issues that are, impact, that are impacting your life all the time and how physics and science affects uh, of those. And I'll wind up telling you about something you probably don't uh, hear about ever in, in a science class, which is the role of religion and morality and artistic sensibilities uh, and their impact on science and vice versa. And I think those are very important issues and uh, are unfortunately not uh, you know, not talked about uh, uh, to any good degree in our society. So I'm going to try and change that and make you think. In fact, uh, hopefully uh, uh, this will scare you a little bit, but uh, I don't know if I'll do that. <laughs> Depends on how brave you are. So, okay, I'm going to uh, first of all start off by reminding you that the 20th century was the century of physics, okay? It, it was many other things, obviously. But uh, the role of physics was huge, okay? And uh, basically, the Nobel started around the turn of the century. And I just thought that it'd be interesting to just overview some of the incredible uh, uh, discoveries listed by the uh, Nobel winners. And so to remind you, it starts off with uh, Rankin and uh, discovery of x-rays. And of course, this had a huge impact from the moment that, it, uh, that he discovered it. And this is not one of those uh, discoveries in science that, that take time to percolate. He was uh, taking pictures of his hand and broken bones in the very first year of discovery of x-rays, okay? And so, uh, seeing into the body was something that uh, was very, very uh, stunningly new. And of course, right around that time was the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel and the Curies. And it's, it's again, hard to uh, Imagine us now not knowing about radioactivity, but these are people who discovered that, in fact, millions of volts of energy are stored in every single particle of uh, all the atoms, and, you know, potentially all the atoms uh, of any radioactive material. You have millions of volts of energy stored into that. That discovery of a whole new world of energy was, was breathtaking. Marconi and Braun uh, developing radio is, a, is an example of a very practical uh, uh, discovery. Uh, the propagation of electromagnetic waves is a physics, you know, is, is a pure physics kind of thing that you can study, but obviously the practical aspects of that in terms of communication are, are what really made that uh, 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 discovery uh, very impressive and deserving of a Nobel Prize. But the next one is quite the opposite. Uh, Max Planck <coughs> and his development of quantum theory, which you learned about, um, took a long, long time, to, uh, in contrast to some of these other things where, <coughs> where the impact was, was immediate on society. Quantum mechanics has taken a long time to really impact society. It, it was a very uh, theoretical, very, uh, um, you know, very detail-oriented science when it was first discovered and took decades to really uh, complete. And in fact, its impact on society is, is 
being felt even now. Uh, things are coming out like um, quantum computing, for instance, which is, is still it, it's in its infancy. And so uh, this is an example of a, a physics discovery uh, that takes a long, long time to impact society. Now I should point out also another aspect of this is, is, that, is the philosophical implications on society. And I don't know I, uh, uh, if you appreciate still the difficulty that quantum mechanics uh, forces on us philosophically. Okay? It says that the universe, at its heart, is a random place. It has no substantial reality that we uh, think about when, you know, day to day. This thing has a reality. It's solid. It's hard. It moves. The quantum realm is not like that at all. And hopefully you got a flavor of that in the, in the lecture on quantum mechanics. Uh, Einstein got his Nobel, actually, for the explanation of the photoelectric effect. But in reality, of course, uh, the Nobel Committee had taken into account all of his um, marvelous work in the year 1905 and 1906, and subsequent to that, uh, the general relativity, relativity in the later, uh, uh, the next decade. And Einstein gave us a, a whole new vision of, uh, of the universe, tying space and time together, and uh, explaining how quantum mechanics impacts the natural world. Uh, he was uh, he was a media star because of his of his impact on the way society viewed the universe, not because of any uh, application, practical application of his of his theories. And so he was a uh, he was a rock star in physics. Now Fermi Fermi uh, was uh, of course the progenitor of nuclear controlled nuclear reactions and. The impact of nuclear, <coughs> controlled nuclear power, including the atomic bomb, of course, uh, as, as you well know, had a huge impact on society. And so uh, I will talk about nuclear energy, in fact, a little bit later in terms of, uh, in terms of energy and the environment. Now, to remind you, in the uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, we start getting into more technical aspects uh, that impact our lives now. Things like semiconductors, for instance, Shakti, Bardeen, and Rattan. Every, all of your lives are impacted by uh, semiconductors. The whole, you know, vast amounts of the gross uh, national product are uh, uh, related to the semiconductor industry. Likewise, for lasers and optical storage, every one of you owns a laser. I guess I've got one right here. And, um, but that was unimaginable in the 60s that everybody would own a laser, okay? And, and it was an obvious when the uh, practical aspects were. Superconductivity uh, in the 70s still hasn't made its, its biggest impact, I think, which is the perfect transmission of electricity, okay? In a world, your world, where electro, electric power is, is, and its generation and its transmission and its efficiency of use is going to be an extremely important uh, uh, thing to worry about, then superconductivity and its, and its perfect electrical transmission may well play a very dominant role. And uh, in the latter half, uh, the discovery of uh, uh, the microwave background is one of these discoveries that um, doesn't impact society practically, but does give us a new vision and, and cemented the idea of a Big Bang, okay? And uh, so, it, there is no question that the universe began in a big bang in a, in a moment 13 billion years ago. And this discovery brought that to light to uh, society. So, and then I, there's others uh, having to do with practical superconductors, room temperature ones, and advances in semiconductors. My point here is, is that we've seen just from this outline several different ways in which science uh, and physics impact society <laughs> dramatically. Okay, with practical consequences, or in in, um, uh, in philosophical ways, where it, it uh, gives us a new way of looking at the universe, a dramatically new way, and we are still doing those kind of discoveries today. So now let's talk about the other direction. That's the impact of physics on society. What about uh, society's impact on physics? 
and, and I'll be going over a lot about this in, in this lecture. So what is society? So uh, society is the interactions among people, okay, in, in a certain culture. And basically, I like to think of it as whatever it makes it into the newspapers, okay? And as you see, politics, technology, arts, sports, religion, sex. I think we'll cover most of these, except for the last one. But uh, this is stuff you don't hear about in science class, okay? And so that's what we're, we're going to talk about it today. And as I've uh, shown you, science has an enormous impact on society, and people love science because of that and because of its uh, practical nature and its philosophical nature. But what kills me is that despite this, uh, news media uh, typically do a terrible job on science reporting. Okay? <laughs> and I like, I like to do the analogy, as I say, hey, they would never do this bad a job when reporting on politics or religion or sports. Let's take the latter, uh, the latter one, sports. You open up a paper every single day, uh, a third of the paper is devoted to sports, okay? And, you know, that's fine as it is, but my point here is, is that it's filled with statistics, right? The sports pages are filled with statistics and information. If you get one of those things wrong, okay, you get the batting average of some well-known uh, ball player wrong, people will know, people will point that out instantly. Okay, and say, you know, what are you crazy? This guy is, you know, much better batter than this. You, you, you know, insulted him by uh, misreporting his uh, his uh, statistics there. On the other hand, a science article, I, I don't know how many times I've done this, where you open up a science and, and you open up the newspaper, read a science article, and it's just wrong. It's just completely wrong from the get go. <laughs> And, and not only subtly wrong, but sometimes it can just be like completely opposite to what the science paper said. And, uh, and then there's the vast number of articles where they get just the statistics wrong. They report some huge effect when, in fact, if you read carefully the science paper that it's uh, based on, uh, in fact, the, the, the effect is not statistically significant, for instance. That happens in medicine all the time. And so this really gets my goat. And... Uh, uh, it's just amazing to me that uh, that, that can happen. So uh, furthermore, I find it astonishing that people listen to judgments about things that are going on in society from political leaders, religious leaders, artists, entertainers, but yet uh, not nearly as much from scientific leaders. I don't know if uh, this group is probably special, but I don't know how many people know the name of any scientist whatsoever. Okay compared to a politician, or a religious leader, an artist, or, uh, or an entertainer. So, so society, there is a, a, a very a, a dichotomy society that I think that we have to solve uh, with the importance of science and physics to society versus the way it gets reported and the way it gets acted on. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples, uh, very de uh, sig uh, significant examples, Here's a list of questions, for instance, that are, that are so important to you and so important to everyone uh, that, that we cannot, we cannot uh, afford to not pay attention to these things. For instance, is the Earth warming up? If so, can we alleviate that? That's a science question, okay? It firmly is a physics question. Is the solution worth the cost is not a question for science, okay? So here's... What I'm trying to get at here is you've got to understand where science's role is in society and where the other things come into play. So that's a political or an economic question. Can we, gener can we physically generate enough energy for the people uh, on Earth? That is a uh, science question, and I'll talk about that uh, briefly. Who pays for it, you know, and, and do we have to fight wars to, to do this or that kind of uh, energy generation? That obviously is not a science question. So there's these different realms of uh, um, responsibility in society. But you've got to ask yourself, what is the science first before you can act on it? Uh, another one is, can we reliably provide a defensive shield against missile attack, missile defense? That's a science question. But it has implications for things like the principle of mutual assured destruction. This is very, very much a political issue. And you can listen to scientists on this. But obviously, politicians have a, a big role to play in answering something like that. 
How healthy can we make people? What is the best way to feed everyone? That is a biology issue, for instance. Uh, but you know, if, if you have to make restrictions on, on the distribution of food or how many children you can have, that's obviously, you know, it's, it's not in the realm of science. And, and finally, like stem cells is a big issue these days. Can they cure disease? Again, a very biological, medical question. It's just, it, it's a factual thing. But is it moral uh, is not a science question. And so you have to understand on these topics where to draw the line, okay? And you can't have, for instance, like I'll be talking about global warming, you can't have Rush Limbaugh talking about the facts of global warming, okay? He's not, uh, he, he can do it, but don't listen to him, okay? Because he's not well versed in the understanding of science and science issues, okay? Now, if he has something to say about how absurd a particular solution is, that's, that's his realm, okay? But uh, I would recommend uh, shutting off your ears when, uh, when people who have no training in, in scientific facts start spouting off about, uh, 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 about scientific uh, topics. Now, this is an, here's an example, a very uh, significant example, I think, of where the media just get the whole thing wrong, okay? It's like a, you'd open the sports page uh, and the Super Bowl was played the previous day, and, they'd, uh, and they say, oh, a couple of football teams played yesterday, and one of them won, you know? That would be the essence of, of how badly they report this. So here is, here is one of these topics, hydrogen car program. President Bush pressed, this is long, several years ago, I made this uh, talk. President Bush pressed his market-based approach to the environment Tuesday night, proposing a billion dollar initiative to develop cars fueled by clean burning hydrogen instead of gasoline. All right, and, and this is still going on today. So you've got to understand uh, what is going on here. So what is hydrogen? Uh, what is hydrogen fuel cell? And why would uh, society want to invest in that? Well, like any reporter would do, you go to Google and you Google hydrogen fuel cells, okay? I did this several years ago, like I said, it may still be active. But what I found as the first link was the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Institute. And here are some quotes. And this is what the reporters love to do, okay? At long last, a technology too long overlooked promises to transform society, offering clean and abundant power, hydrogen-based fuel cells could soon end our reliance on oil and minimize emissions of pollution and global warming gases. Okay, that's your hook. That's what the, the science reporter loves to see. And then put aside the environmental advantages to fuel cells. Still, their promise is extraordinary. They're, because water and heat is produced, but nothing else. So why aren't our fuel cells now powering our office? Because until very recently, their costs were far too high, okay? And I actually saw reporters actually taking almost this verbatim, okay? That's great, you know, you can, you can go and make, you just talk to your scientists, get them to, you know, make cheaper fuel cells, okay? Well, that's, unfortunately, you don't, you don't, uh, it doesn't work that way, okay? There's certain physics realities involved. A hydrogen fuel cell creates electricity from the chemical oxidation of hydrogen. Obviously, molecular hydrogen is required for this. There is no molecular hydrogen on this planet, okay? Instead, you have to create hydrogen somehow, and that means you're using energy, another energy source to split water or to heat up a fossil fuel and crack it open to get the hydrogen, okay? So what energy source now is dominantly used to create hydrogen? Why well, you burn coal, oil, and gas to do it, okay? That's the way you get hydrogen, okay? And so, you know, but aren't hydrogen fuel cells a great energy storage device and, you know, a genius reporter will get past that first uh, obvious uh, kind of problem and say, well, they are a nice battery, aren't they? Well, not if the efficiency of producing the hydrogen, transporting it to the fuel cell, charging them up, and then getting that high electricity out, what if that whole efficiency of that cycle is worse than just charging up a battery from the, from the oil and gas originally? And that's about the situation because the round trip efficiency in a fuel cell is currently about 30%, okay? Now, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that these don't play a role in society, okay? But did anybody understand this, this just dominant, simple uh, concept from reading the newspapers? I think not, okay? I, I looked at a lot of the newspaper articles and none of them said, well, where are we getting the, where are we getting the hydrogen from? You know, where are we, uh, 
where, uh, what kind of energy source are we using to create the hydrogen? What is the efficiency of that round trip? It's, it's just appalling how poorly these issues, which are really crucial for your future, are reported. So the essence of the debate on energy is, you know, what primary energy source do you want to use? And so, uh, as far as I can tell, <coughs> there is only four g generic classes of energy production, okay? And so, uh, one is burning hydrocarbon uh, fossil fuels, or no, just burning hydrocarbons. <coughs> and this means fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. That's uh, quite obviously <coughs> very familiar. The other is uh, using hydrocarbons that you grow out of the ground, biomass, biofuels. Okay, I, I actually am a big fan of biofuels because that takes carbon out of the atmosphere and then when you burn it, puts it back. And that makes a complete CO2 cycle. And so I think, for instance, society should uh, dominantly be going towards that direction uh, with some of these others in the mix as well. And so, uh, <clears throat> but that, and I come to that from kind of a physics point of view. Okay, if your if your goal is to is to get energy in a continuous basis without affecting the environment, you know, clearly you want to cycle, and and you want to make that your dominant form of uh, energy. That's that's just my opinion, but that's a scientific opinion. The society aspects come in from. All right, now you have to convert a lot of land over to production of biofuels. And is that <coughs> worth it? Who's the winner? Who's the loser? You know, do you want to fight a war to get land to, uh, to, to do this? Or do you want your friends to have the, the, the upper hand in creating biofuels? Some of the other uh, sources are, of course, nuclear power plays a role. But again, uh, you never see this reported. How much? How much uranium is there on the planet? Anybody yeah. know how long will it last? Ten years. How much? Ten years. Ten years. It's it's a little bit longer than that, but you know, on the order of fifty years or something like that, decades. Okay, so uh, at at the current rate of usage, if you increase the usage, yeah, it could last you know ten or twenty years, and that's it. Okay, so unless you make a breeder reactor and use that as uh, then nuclear has significant problems just in its fuel and the amount of fuel it has. Fusion is a great option, and we should be investing in that. Then there are, uh, so those are the nuclear aspects. Terrestrial sources are things like geothermal energy, tides. This is a neat little snake uh, project that they have in Portugal that, you know, as it bounces up and down on the waves, uh, I should say t tides and waves here, uh, it generates electricity. In fact, there's an article in today's New York Times about the generation of electricity from, uh, from waves. And then, of course, there's wind power, which all, all these things I'm in favor of because they have very little, uh, very little uh, pollution uh, at the end. And, of course, solar is a very good one, too. But you need very large arrays. This is an example of an array of just mirrors that are focusing light on this big uh, uh, tower. And this is in Australia. And, and that just creates hot air rising. It's a very simple, very easy, uh, you know, the physics of this is trivial. Hot air rises, okay. But I guess my point here is <clears throat> what, what is driving the debate on energy? And basically it is science, dominantly science, physics in particular because energy is a physics issue. And then of course there's the society impacts, which are like politics. And so the, this, I talked about this at the beginning because this is the most important issue for you guys, I think, in your, in your life. And you gotta start thinking about it intelligently, okay? You, you, you can't, uh, as an example, I, I don't have this, uh, I don't talk about this, but let's talk about biofuels, for instance. Right now, they're pushing corn as biofuels, uh, as a biofuel. But if you look up the efficiency of corn as a biofuel producer, it is the worst, of the worst of all biofuels, okay? Uh, um, you know, it, it, they're not by a little bit, but like a factor of 10, okay? And so I have seen a list of the various biofuel plants. Corn is at the very bottom. It is the worst thing you want to use. What's the best? Well, there's something called Jatropha, which is a really nice uh, plant that just like produces these pods bursting with oil. Okay, so you know why not plant that? Okay, it's ten times more efficient. 
And it's, it's like a weed, you can plant it anywhere. So uh, to my mind, you, you would just want to convert huge tracts of wasteland into, uh, into jatropha uh, plants. Here's another example, though, a little closer to home, about how Fermilab could, could help uh, this, this issue. Uh, amazingly enough, accelerators can be the trigger mechanism in a, in a relatively clean thorium reactor. Okay, This is not uranium like normal fission reactors, it's a thorium reactor. And this is called an accelerator driven reactor. Because you bring in a beam of uh, protons into a, a pile of thorium, you can generate neutrons such that that transforms it into uranium-235, which then uh, fizzes. And thorium is thousands of times more abundant than scarce uranium. And like I said earlier, at present rates, your uranium will last only 50 years. And the byproducts of this reaction don't include the long-lived products that normally you get from uranium. Okay? Uh, there's still radioactive waste, but it's on the order of tens or hundreds of years half-life versus thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of years as in a uranium reactor. So, my feeling is that accelerators can play a huge role in, uh, in energy production for society. But we've got to get on the ball, okay? Uh, we, we've got to approach the problem <coughs> uh, rationally, and we have not done that up to this point. We have not had a rational discourse on energy in this society. So that's quite unfortunate. Now, in a related issue, uh, the environment. And uh, I just want to point out that Fermilab is an environmental research park. Okay? It's designated a national environmental research park, one of only six in the, in the nation. And we dedicate quite a bit of effort to uh, the restoration of the original prairie plants that were uh, here uh, before uh, the, pra the settlers came. And so you know, every spring and fall, we come around, and our firemen don't put out fires. They set fires, actually. I don't know. Has, has anybody here seen this laboratory on fire? See the after Yeah, you, actually, you can. I think you can even see the black uh, charred plants right now. But uh, <coughs> every year they set the laboratory on fire. It's really a beautiful sight. So if you ever see, um, if you ever see towering clouds of uh, smoke coming out of the laboratory, come on outside. It's really fun. Uh, you can you, you go down the, the the road and there'll be like fire sometimes on either side of you. It's really uh, Pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't do it at night. They do it only on, of course, very, very low wind days and during the day. And of course, they, you know, they do it right. Our firemen are very good. But uh, the biggest issue in the environment is the greenhouse effect. Okay, and the scope and cause of global warming is a physics issue and must be addressed in a scientific, not a political way. Okay. That is, the science of it must be addressed in a scientific way, okay? As I, re uh, let me reiterate, you don't want to turn on your radio and hear some <clears throat> somebody blathering on about the science of global warming <clears throat> who hasn't had a firm grounding in this, okay? I'm not an expert on it. There are huge uncertainties, but the point is, is you, is you don't address these certainties in a uh, political fashion or a uh, talk radio kind of fashion you have to hit the books, okay? You have to do your homework. And so, you gotta look at data. And here's, for example, an, uh, a graph of the combined land uh, surface air and sea, land and sea uh, surface temperatures over the last, what is it, about 150 years or so. And, and you can see a trend here, okay? And this is particularly dominant in the Arctic regions. And so, there's a very good physics mechanism explaining all this, and that is the increased carbon dioxide content in an atmosphere can absorb more long wavelength radiation. This is a science issue, right? It's not a, not a politics kind of thing. <clears throat> and in fact, if you look back in time over a half a million years, then this is the natural variation in CO2 concentrations, and this is where we'll be in your lifetime, something that this Earth has not seen in a million years, or millions of years, I should say, many millions of years, okay? Because you can go back in time even further. But this just shows how temperature and CO2 are, are quite related. Uh, in this instance, uh, this will, uh, the, the temperature uh, will affect carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide affects temperature. It's a very difficult 
business trying to reconstruct these temperature changes from both the solar influence and the carbon dioxide influence. But people have done this, and they know how to do this kind of work, okay? The point is, is it's a very scary place to be, okay? And so um, we understand the driving force of carbon dioxide on the, uh, uh, what's called forcing of the atmosphere, which you measure in watts per square meter. This is a very physics-driven issue. And so, and so we have a whole uh, agency that's supposed to be devoted to this kind of uh, research, okay? Environmental Protection Agency. And they put out some time ago a, uh, um, you know, a, a, a nice, <laughs> what I consider a very nice uh, summary, which is what do you know for certain? You know, what are the aspects of this problem you know for certain? What is likely but not certain <coughs> where more research is need to be done? And there's some big unknowns. And, and you know, the bit that I'll be first to admit that there's huge unknowns about this issue. But uh, here you can see a, a classic interplay uh, between science and politics, okay? And this is a, a National Academy of Sciences, which is, which is, you should very, very well respect on all scientific issues. It is the nation's science board, okay? And they uh, have a report on the current research plan for global climate change. Again, this was a couple of years ago, but still relevant. And this guy from the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is really a political lobbying group, said, look at this report from the National Academy of Sciences. It says that the president is using his research plan as cover to create the impression that they're concerned about global warming. He says he wants sound science to guide the debate, yet dismisses and avoids anything that doesn't mesh with his political views. We call on the administration to heed the National Academy of Sciences' advice to lead our country into a future well-informed about the risks of climate change and uh, ways of addressing it. So, this is a classic case of a huge clash between science and politics, and you gotta separate the two and find out what's going on. How do we deal, if at all, with those who claim that global warming is an issue? Well, again, that, uh, the, the question, if you didn't hear, was how, how do you respond to people about who, who say that the increased CO2 levels aren't made by man, for instance? Yeah. That, yeah. Well, it turns out that's a science issue, okay? It's not a politics issue. You go and you look it up. Well, there's certain isotopes of carbon that are, um, that are you know, come from uh, uh, fossil fuels versus uh, sources in the natural environment, okay? And you can measure those isotope ratios. And so you go in and you measure them and you, and you compare them to what you expect. It, you know, there's a prediction, there's a measurement, there is a conclusion. You know, it's, it's a very science-oriented thing. It's not a politics-oriented thing. And so it could be that the cost of addressing global warming is, uh, is, is too much, okay, for society. That may be true, and that's not a scientist's point uh, where, where he can argue. That is a politician or an economist's point of view, okay? But you gotta get the science right first. So, here's another uh, huge uh, societal issue, and that's physics and war. And World War II, of course, was uh, one of the seminal events of the 20th century, if not the seminal event. It reshaped the entire globe and the nature of international relations. Nerds played a very big role in this conflict, and uh, the development of radar <coughs> uses the same type of kind of Kleistron power amplifiers uh, that we use here. Uh, computers came out of this uh, uh, conflict for codes and also for computing ballistic trajectories, and of course, the atomic bomb, which was quite a, uh, a dramatic conclusion to that event. And scientists play a huge role in this conflict for the same reason everybody did, because it was needed, and they felt obligated to, to contribute to society in this fashion. But it was interesting that a core group of scientists, uh, quite a few of them based here in Chicago, uh, protested the notion of using scientific efforts, specifically the atomic bomb, to enhance war capability. And those same kinds of political uh, playoffs uh, between science and, and, in this case, war, go on today, okay? You'll see quite a few uh, scientists take that kind of moral stance, but you got to realize that's a moral stance. Okay, that's a political stance of uh, a group of people, and and that that can be argued about by politicians or commentators 
or bloggers or what have you. You know, that's the attitude of scientists is their attitude, but but the science is a different issue. Okay. Um, here's an example of a, a great uh, uh, scientist soldier. He's the guy that basically developed uh, Fermilab. He was the first president of the overseers uh, who built Fermilab and, and got the funding for it and all that. Uh, he, before that, he was headed up the group developing three centimeter radar at MIT. And, you know, for instance, that was the decisive factor for uh, the Battle of Britain. And I remember him giving a talk in, in this auditorium about, you know, his, the good old days. And he talked about going through Morocco with a little crystal in his pocket. Uh, and Morocco was controlled by the Nazis, but it was a neutral country that you could get up to England with. You couldn't go directly from the U.S. to England because uh, of blockades. So this is, uh, it was a, he was a spy uh, smuggling in, you know, one of the key elements for radar into, uh, uh, into Britain. It was a really uh, a fantastic lecture. I really enjoyed listening to him say that because he was really low key about it, you know. But clearly, if he had been caught, that was big trouble. And after that uh, impressive achievement, he went on and joined the Manhattan Project and served as head of the delivery group. So the, basically the guy who actually delivered the bomb uh, to the war uh, theater. Here's another great scientist warrior related to Fermilab. And that's the, the, the first director of this laboratory, the man responsible for the, all the art you see around, the statues, the buffalo. The whole nature of this laboratory is this guy's responsibility, Robert Wilson. And uh, he gave our laboratory the distinctive character it possesses today. As our, uh, one of our previous directors says, we inherit from him the tradition of building large and powerful accelerators. In addition, he planned and designed Fermilab's striking physical campus from the restored prairie to the architecture. And uh, Bob Wilson's legacy survives at Fermilab in the surrounding communities and in the world of science. And he, uh, is his ashes are uh, he has a memorial on site also a burial ceremony for him here and he was the cyclotron group leader in the Manhattan Project the, the guy uh, responsible for uh, purifying uh, uranium isotopes using <coughs> cyclotrons so uh, there are great examples of physicists making huge contributions to war now the biggest technological physics oriented uh, uh, issue in war today is is probably missile defense and so this of course is a scheme where you intercept missiles that are being sent to us or, or our allies by other missiles and so this is a technical problem and it's well addressed by science okay and uh, you know the question of whether you want to do this or how much it costs that's a, a very much a political issue but what I want to address is what about the science? And we had a guy named Ted Postel come here from uh, MIT. This was some years ago, 2002, as it says here. But this, again, is a great example of, of the intersection between science and uh, society. He came and he talked about testing missile defense. And he says, well, it worked. At least that's what we were told. But shortly after the experiment flew, three people came up and brought new evidence to light. Their information, coupled with my own investigation, uh, points to a different story, one of failure, a finding seemingly confirmed this February by the uh, government's accounting office. I believe that the top management of the Pentagon's Missile Defense Agency have misrepresented or distorted the results derived from the experiments and rigged the follow-on test programs that continues to this day. This was 2002. And these deliberate actions have hidden the system's vulnerabilities from the White House. This here, again, is, is a huge example where science and, and society play uh, incredible roles with each other. You know, the scientists were given a job to do, to do an experiment to see if this technology works that could pen potentially save a lot of lives. Well, uh, did the experiment work or not? That is a science issue, okay? And he showed the data in his talk here that was pretty demonstrative that it was a failure, okay? And... Uh, did people lie about this? Well, I have yet to see this fully addressed since then, and I have yet to see the data uh, reported in the newspaper. Why the heck is there not a graph in the newspaper that you can see? You know, he had plenty of figures to show. Why didn't one of those figures show up in the newspaper? Okay, and, and was discussed. Because then that is a factual issue that can be discussed. Now, obviously, it impacts, uh, a, you know, 
huge, it has a huge political impact. So this is again, I don't want to belabor any single point here that I'm talking about, environment, energy, war, whatever, except to make you guys realize that there are science issues that have to be resolved, and then there are political issues that have to be resolved. They interplay, but you have to understand the realm of each of those. And, and, and it's important. This is really important stuff. So coming down off of that uh, rather uh, emotional issues, uh, let me just point out another big aspect of uh, science and what we do here at Fermilab has to do with computation. And uh, the semiconductor industry is thriving. It's a physics-generated uh, issue. Many of the most complicated problems that computers address are physics issues, atomic explosions, atmospheric phenomena. And the creation of the World Wide Web was, in fact, a physics, particle physics-driven issue. That's Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, from CERN. There's your first web page. That's from CERN, our sister particle physics laboratory in, uh, in Europe. And in fact, um, uh, in 1992, they had the first World Wide Web conference, and there weren't enough websites to fit in this circle here. So they put down the word you. You could be part of the World Wide Web. And you'll notice Fermilab is there. We're upside down, but that's OK. We were the second website in the, world, in, in the United States. Okay, I can remember surfing the web in this time period when you could surf to one location. So we, we, didn't, call it, we didn't call it surfing, okay. But um, I don't have a picture here, but at the, you, you guys took a tour of the, of the grid computing uh, center. And so we, we were involved in the World Wide Web production, we're involved in Linux uh, uh, operating system production now, and we're involved in grid, uh, the next stage of information processing. Uh, on, on the uh, internet, which is called the grid. And that's being developed at CERN and Fermilab and Argonne. And this is another example, which, which has mostly just pleasant consequences. There's, there's very little uh, controversy associated with this uh, in terms of uh, the society, but this is a, where a nice uh, 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 non-confrontational impact of physics can be had on society. Okay, so here we go. Now we're gonna get into the real deep stuff. Uh, Buckle your seatbelts. Uh, <clears throat> religion is a huge aspect of society, okay? And we have, if, if we don't talk about religion and science, we're not doing our job, okay? Now the question is, can you be science, uh, a scientist? Can a scientist be religious? And can a religious person be a scientist? And that's an experimental question that's been answered yes, uh, many times at this laboratory. This is a uh, Catholic priest that was here. Father Tim Tuey, okay? And as it says here, uh, this is Wilson's uh, tribute to uh, Tuey when he died. It wasn't roses all the way. Tragedy began to strike as, this is as we were building Fermilab. Disease, even death, nowhere in the annals of physics are such things mentioned. Uh, nor had my previous experiments, experience prepared me to cope with them. Uh, I soon found that Tim was a cracking good physicist at the lab as well as a Jesuit priest. He would appear on such occasions full of compassion, sympathy, and understanding. And despite a difference in our religious beliefs, we became close friends. So this is an example of, of how you can meld uh, a religious life and a scientific life. But there are confrontations, and we have to talk about those, okay? And so one problem is when religion tries to confront science on its own turf, and evolution is the best example of this problem. Many religious organizations deny that evolution of life forms have taken place on the planet, whereas the scientific evidence, uh, there, there, there's, no, uh, there's no scientific evidence for questioning that. If the theory of evolution is on, the, is on par with the theory of gravity, for instance. And so this has to be reconciled in some fashion for anybody who wants to be involved in science and, and have a religious life. I believe it is very easy to be religious and believe in evolution because the time scales are so huge and, and global and, and, and magnificent that I don't see a problem. Do you think the word theory places a sort of a rhetorical disadvantage? You think there's another word that you can use? Can no. The theory. question is, is, should we use the word theory for the theory of evolution? No, it's a great theory, okay? I, I, have, no, I have no problem with the word theory. As I say, there's the germ theory of disease. We never 
we never question that, you know, or the theory of gravity, for instance. It's it's a fine word. Right, I was just saying it's so easily parried. Yeah. Oh, you, you it's so easily it questioned in the sense of it being a, yeah, just a theory, right? Yeah, people, ooh, and, and I understand the difference. I no, I don't think we should retreat from using the word theory. It's a fine. It, it's it's a what theories are in science are a, is a global view of a lot of of evidence. Okay. Theories can be proved wrong, okay? And so, uh, but typically they overarch a huge body of evidence that, that is very hard to overturn. For instance, Newton's theory of gravity was not overturned. It was augmented by Einstein's theory of gravity, okay? Uh, so anyway, but what about the other direction? Does science try to invade religion's turf? And I think the answer, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying it's on it's on the same scientific level of, of explaining a lot of the question was how is the theory of evolution equated with the theory of gravity? I'm simply saying it has as much evidence beneath it uh, as the theory of gravity or the germ theory of disease. It explains a lot of evidence, okay? And so, in that sense, it's a scientific, well-established scientific theory. And so, um, and, and so, but it's a big, obviously a big issue in society. I don't mind talking about it because hiding, hiding this fact is, 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 is silly. We, we should talk about it. Now the question is, does science try to invade religion's turf? And I think yes, I think it does. Uh, there are things that are firmly within the religious realm where scientists have come out against or for that essentially uh, they're not as well equipped as uh, you know a, as religion is to deal with it. For instance, using evolution as the only tool to discuss human interactions, namely social Darwinism, discounts deep emotional and moral and historical elements of society. Okay, and so I think this is a pretty much uh, not a great way of discussing society. So in other words, that we've evolved our little social interactions through physical evolution. Another example, cloning. There's no particular scientific reason to fear cloning. It's the same thing as twinning, okay? Uh, you know, twinning in the womb. But perhaps there are uh, very good societal reasons for not wanting, you know, for, for wanting to disallow cloning, okay? And if you hear a scientist bloviating about this, you should probably shut your ears about uh, to him, to the scientist, because or her, because that's firmly in the realm of, uh, you know, uh, uh, politicians have every right to say, oh, shut up, you, you, you dumb scientists, you don't know what you're talking about. Or this religious person would never say shut up because they're usually very polite. And, uh, <laughs> but they would say, you don't know what you're talking about because you're addressing it from a scientific point of view, not from a, a societal or moral point of view. And uh, likewise for stem cells. Medical advances seem to be certain if scientists experiment with stem cells. And you will see many, many scientists, uh, biologists, who say, Come on, you know, just let us do this. Uh, we this is a great avenue for scientific advance, okay? But uh, there are legitimate moral objections by some to making embryos a tool. I think the church should the church should be the last one to talk about morals because if we look through the past, uh, they've done a lot uh, of immoral things. Now I don't want to get into a religious discussion here, uh, and so I I, I want to shut off that whole avenue of discussion about the morality of religion. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about how science and, and society interact, okay? And so um, I, I, I would disagree with your, with your analysis there, but that's another, another issue altogether. And so, but my point is, is that there are realms where moral and religious values trump science, okay? And so always keep that in mind. Now, here's the key thing, though. This is, this is where the two intersect gracefully and, and, and gratifyingly, okay? If you want to search for the sacred and the majestic and the mysterious in science, you don't have to go very far. You guys are there, okay? The, don't think biology, think physics, okay? That's where the grace, the, the majesty is in, in, uh, uh, in the universe. For instance, what is dark energy? It pervades all of space-time and is forcing the universe to expand. We have no theory for it. Our best calculations are about a factor of 10 to the 60th in error. And if that dark energy was not there in precisely the right amount, this universe wouldn't be here. 
Why are the physical parameters of this universe so exquisitely balanced such that life can exist? I'm not saying that these are evidence for God or, 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 or should induce a religious feeling in you, but the point is, is this is where the spheres of science and physics and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, transcendental issues uh, can match, in, and that is in cosmology and quantum mechanics. For instance, how can we possibly reconcile the random nature of quantum mechanics with our own notions of causation? Okay? Is there something that's hidden from us at the most basic level of, 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 of the universe? And so these huge questions that, you know, are we one of many, many possible universes that simply is randomly selected to have the laws uh, and, and physical parameters that allow life to, to form? Okay? Are we just some random nugget out there? But to my mind, uh, you know, always concentrating on biology misses the big picture. And, and, and the majesty of this universe is just inconceivable. And, and it's very hard to describe, except in, in, in when, you, when you study it deeply in physics, you get there. Now here's an example where I think religion and science have uh, accommodated themselves to each other. And this is the Catholic catechism. Now, I'm not out proselytizing for being Catholics, okay? And so, um, but my point is, is the poetry here. Uh, the Catholic Catechism says, though faith is above reason, there can never be any real discrepancy between faith and reason, since the same God who reveals mysteries and infuses faith has bestowed the light of reason on the human mind. God cannot deny himself, nor can truth contradict truth. And likewise, later on, it says, the question about the origins of the world and of man has been the object of many scientific studies, which have splendidly enriched our knowledge of the age and dimensions of the cosmos. That's what I was trying to uh, say in the previous slide development of life forms and the appearance of man. And these discoveries invite us to even greater admiration for the greatness of the Creator, prompting us to give Him thanks. Why can't that be the basis for a, uh, a reconciliation, if you will, between uh, the grand view of physics and the grand view of religion? Okay? To my mind, uh, there's, no, there's no clash that's necessary. Okay? Others would say differently, but I'm teaching this class. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> Now let's talk about the morality of science, which isn't necessarily the same thing as religion. Morality and it's separate from a religion, okay? And I'm going to talk to you about a very fundamental aspect of morality, and that is there are not two sides to every question in science, okay? Typically there's these theories, and they overarch huge quantities of, uh, uh, of evidence, data, and, and uh, explanatory power. And there's a lot of detail work that goes on in science to fit in under this umbrella of a theory. Ever so often, there will be a huge dramatic shift that will shift, uh, you know, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in, in the 20th century, uh, the discovery of plate tectonics completely shifted uh, the, the, the realm of um, physical geology, you know, into now an understanding of volcanoes and earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, by shifting plates. And that was a huge shift in, in uh, uh, geology that took place dramatically uh, uh, over a short period of time. We're going through a revolution right now in particle physics where dark energy and dark matter could change our view of all of physics. We don't know yet, okay? So we're on that realm of discovery. But, oh, typically there's this huge theory that just explains a lot of things. Now, the tendency of people, though, is to consider alternative viewpoints equally. That's not, a, unfortunately, you have to break that habit as a scientist. You have to get your brain to be able to weight things according to the evidence, the physical evidence, okay? No matter what you feel like. And this can give the appearance of harshness and rigidity and, and, and perhaps amorality, you know? Why can't you scientists think, uh, you know, uh, of another way of doing things? Or why are you so rigid in your beliefs? But indeed, I think science is more attuned to this issue than any other endeavor. It requires a person to be able to change his deeply held beliefs if the evidence demands it, okay? And I've seen this happen, you know, at, to various extents, where a person has to say, hey, my life's, all my life's work is wrong, okay? Uh, you know, the, the, the evidence indicates that I was wrong for the last 10 years. 
And it's very rare to, to see that kind of uh, flexibility in, in politics, or religion, or business, art, whatever. So I think in terms of society, science is actually uh, a very uh, uh, flexible kind of uh, endeavor. Obviously, science can be used for amoral or immoral, or immoral purposes, but anything can in, in society. Okay, It's not that science has this harshness to it that makes it easy to pervert, for instance. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, I see no way in which science can be perverted any more than any other endeavor of, of mankind. And finally, this leads me into my favorite topic, which is art. And uh, Fermilab may very well be the world's premier uh, uh, nexus between physics and art, okay? This place is well suited to exploring aspects of art and science. And this is due to the influence of Robert Wilson, as I said earlier. These are examples of his statues. Beautiful, beautiful statues with physical meaning to them. And uh, he built them himself. And uh, this appreciation for art has now even translated itself into the underground neutrino laboratory up in uh, Minnesota. And if you're ever uh, in the Boundary Waters area, you go down in the Sudan mine, and there's this gorgeous uh, mural there right next to our huge 5,000 ton neutrino detector, okay? And so, um, and, and this thing has uh, a lot of meaning to it. It's really great, it's really beautiful. Now, does science interfere with an artistic sensibility? I should know because most of my family are artists, okay? And artists see the world differently than scientists do, okay? They're concerned with emotional responses to nature. They don't have to make sense, okay? Their artwork can make sense in this one day and not make sense the next day, and they have no problem uh, switching between the two. It can be nonsensical. It can be, you know, mixtures. It can. It has no. It has no boundaries. It doesn't have the same boundaries as science, I should say. And for this reason, artists sometimes push away rigorous scientific thinking. I've been in arguments with my sister a lot. They assume that it limits your range of emotions, okay, because of the of the, the structure of it, and. There are some things like called deconstructionist literary theories. And, and this is an attempt to portray the world as having no fixed boundaries or fixed truths, okay? It's a very non-scientific way of looking at things. But this all stems from a uh, belief that uh, pursuing scientific knowledge of the world destroys one's ability to have an emotional response to it. It's wrong. That is just false, okay? Scientists have emotional response to the world around them. And most of my colleagues are involved in some fashion with the arts or, or society or you know some aspect of that, and um, you know go to operas, play musical instruments, create artworks. We have an art gallery here that's filled sometimes by by the uh, um, uh, pieces from uh, you know uh, employees that they've made. So this this is kind of the crux. This summarizes kind of the problem: battle of the poets. And you have to choose which way you want to live. Edgar Allan Poe, one of my favorite uh, poets, sonnet to science. Science, true daughter of old time thou art, who alterest all things with thy peering eyes. Why prayest thou thus upon the poet's heart? Vulture, whose wings are dull of reality. <laughs> and a lot of artists feel that way, that science is this horrible vulture that is preying upon their delicate emotions. On the, other, on the other hand, uh, Alfred Noyes wrote this great poem called uh, Watchers of the Sky about, uh, about science, you know, scientists and, and in fact, uh, astronomers. Fool, and this is one of my favorite stanzas. Fools have said that knowledge drives out wonder from the world. They'll say it still, though all the dust ablaze with the miracles at their feet. And what you should have learned by now is the dust is ablaze with miracles, okay? Everything at your feet is miraculous every aspect of it. It's wonderful, and it can be explained by science. That doesn't lessen the miraculousness of it. And so I'd like to finally end by the, one of my favorite quotes. This is Wilson, this is Robert Wilson, who built this laboratory. And in 1969, when they were building this laboratory, uh, he was testifying before Congress, and one of the senators who was really against this place said, why, you know, how does this accelerator improve the security of the country? And Wilson said it had nothing at all to do with security. And the senator said, 
how can you possibly stand here and request all this money for something that doesn't in involve the security of this country? And Wilson said, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about, it has nothing to do directly with defending our country, except making it worth defending. And I believe this is true of science in general, and I hope you've you've appreciated uh, what we do at this laboratory over those uh, last uh, some weeks that you've been here on Saturday Morning Physics, and uh, we, we hope you go out there and appreciate the world of science uh, further. So thanks for your uh, thanks for your attention.